Story time. I'm a county park ranger. My beat includes a big lake and an even bigger campground. I enforce rules, patrol the water, and troubleshoot electrical hookups when campers can't tell the difference between 30 and 50 amp plugs. I have to admit, the park is pretty pathetic, an uninspiring spread of dusty, eucalyptus-dotted scrubland ringed by barren hills. The only real attraction is the artificial lake, 5,000 filthy acres of swimmable, fishable, boatable water. You'll never catch me touching that water, though, one year they drained some of it and found a layer of human shit three feet deep. Now look. I used to be a cop. I've smelled dumpster corpses in the dog days of summer and hoarder houses crowded with dead animals. But the smell of that giant underwater shit cake baking in the July sun tops it all. Anyhow, ours is the only campground this side of the county with a constant, active ranger presence. There's good reason for it. It's a huge, rural park. We have issues with vagrants and meth cookers. Also, any time you pack hundreds of drunk campers in tight quarters a few yards from the water, you're going to have problems. People drown. Trailers catch fire. Idiots pilot boats when they're drunk and end up killing each other. Body parts wash up pretty regularly. Fingers, toes, the occasional limb. Legacies, I guess, of accidents and unalives. At least once a summer, some gangbanger shoots a rival gangbanger and traumatizes everyone in the park. Yet they keep coming, every summer, without fail. Now, park rules dictate that the lake stays empty from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. No swimmers, no boaters, no exceptions. So when a camper complained about a rogue midnight sailor disturbing the peace in the wee hours of July 26, I had to take care of it. Stepping out of the air-conditioned ranger station into the hot night was a special kind of torture. Heat descended immediately, thick and suffocating as a quilt, so dense it felt hard to breathe. Moving through it was like walking through water. I could almost see it, veils of soft red and bruised purple, shimmering just past the boundary of human perception. It was a little better out on the water. Still dispiritingly hot, but thinner, somehow, breathable. I steered the patrol boat past the dock and circled the perimeter. It took a while, the lake's almost eight square miles and the boat's a puttering little relic of a bygone age. I shut it off periodically, listening for the telltale echo of a motor. Nothing. Just wind and the lapping of water against the boat. The lake has a few man-made islands. Nothing fancy, just mounds of dirt covering infrastructure access points. When the perimeter proved empty, I decided to check them out. I pulled close to the biggest one and killed the engine. Here, far away from the RVs and tents and campfires, the temperature was almost bearable. I looked up impulsively. A vast array of pale stars spiraled across the velvet sky. I caught sight of the Big Dipper and smiled wistfully. What I'd give to be able to fly, to float up into the tatters of cold, wet clouds and drift under the starlight. I shook myself and scanned the island. Just rocks, litter, and dry vegetation and their unsettling shadows. I heaved a sigh and continued the search. Right around the time distance and darkness reduced the island to a dim shadow, I sighed again and shut off the boat. I looked up the sky, and frowned. The stars were different. In the early hours, stars have a high, cold look to them. But these were warm and multicolored, yellow, gold, swampy green and dim, dur red. I'm a little fuzzy on my constellations, but I know the Big Dipper. I'd just seen it. But it was gone. In its place were flowery arrays, like fireworks set off at a great height and frozen in place. A shudder crawled down my back. I spun around, dimly aware that my heart was pounding, and saw a boat. Relief and irritation shot through me. I pulled up beside it, throwing on every light I had. The harsh white illumination showed two figures sitting in a motorboat, a little boy and an old man. My stomach dropped unpleasantly. He had some kind of facial injury, one of his wide, round eyes drooped past the spot where his cheekbone should be, 
and his head was uneven and unpleasantly small. Four pink scars bubbled across his face, stark and strange in the harsh light. Several black garbage bags were crumpled on the floor of the boat, atop which an open tackle box lay. Are you y'all kidding me? I asked brusquely. You seen the rules? Nobody on the water after 10 p.m. It is now 2 in the morning, so what do you think you're doing? Night fishing, the boy mumbled. The man stood up. I didn't know, officer. I thought I'd take him, out on the water. We don't like going in the daylight. He smiled thinly. The effect was objectively ghastly, but oddly heart-wrenching. People stare. Makes it kind of hard for me. I've been ready to ticket them with the highest fine I could impose, but faced with the reality of it, a father and son, trying to make memories in a world that didn't even want them to exist, I couldn't do it. I understand. I do, and I'll let you off this time. But we have rules here. People are trying to sleep, all right? I'll escort you back to shore. The pair exchanged a weird glance. Then the man nodded. Okay. Thank you, officer. Thank you. He turned and lost his balance briefly. His coat fell open, revealing a familiar uniform. A golden star glimmered on his chest. A sheriff badge. I blinked, and suddenly his coat was closed again, obscuring the clothing beneath. Just then, the boy slipped something overboard. It hit the water with a loud plop. What was that? I barked. You need help fishing it out? The boy shook his head, white face practically glowing. And no. It was just a, nothing. I turned my flashlight on the water and caught a glimpse of something long, ragged, and pale drifting down. Blood clouded behind it like watercolor. A human arm. My hand flew reflexively to my duty belt. Hold still. Don't you goddamn move. At that moment something huge and white erupted from the murk, slithering along the side of the motorboat. An enormous ribbon of moonlight, cutting through the water like a phantom. I watched, stunned, as that ribbon caught the arm and began to eat. What is that? I barely recognized my own voice. What the hell, what are you people doing? The man licked his lips and tried to give me another smile. It defies nature as we know it. If we feed it, it stays small. If we don't feed it, it grows. He was trembling, I noticed. Trembling so hard his coat fluttered. We can't let it grow anymore. It's already pulling the other world through to ours. Like thread through a needle. When it gets enough thread, it'll start making stitches. I looked up at the sky again. Firework constellations, pulsing in a thousand colors that were too warm and far too strange. Then that long, eerie wraith whipped at my boat, hitting it with enough force to make me lose my balance. I fell against the railing as the creature surfaced. Don't look. The man wailed. But he was too late. I caught a glimpse of an awful face, predatory yet strangely unformed, with hollow dark eyes and a gaping, yawing mouth spiked with warm, pulsing lights like stars. I closed my eyes and prayed as the boat creaked and the water lapped. After a long time, the boy squeaked, it's full. We can go now. He didn't need to tell me twice. About halfway across the lake, I heard the rumble of a motor and looked back. The man and the boy and their little motorboat were behind me. The man gave me an encouraging smile. I looked away and shuddered. Then, heart pounding so heavily I felt ill, I turned to the sky. The stars were as they should be, pale and cold, arranged in familiar constellations. There was the Big Dipper, shining down like an old friend. I breathed a sigh of relief as I approached the shore. Ever since that night, I've been telling myself that I had a nightmare. Or even a hallucination. Maybe I'm ill, too ill to be a ranger. Too ill to have any job. But something happened a few days later. Something I can't get out of my mind. Something that scares me more than I've ever been in my life. On July 28th, a woman found a leg on the shore of my lake. No one knows where it came from. Stories are flying all around the county, it was an person who unalived himself. It must belong to a girl who's been missing for a few months. 
It's just related to a tragic accident. The authorities won't drain the lake to look for the rest of the body. They say it's impossible, that 5,000 acres is too much. Even to look into a potential murder. The thing is. They emptied it out a while ago just to clean up some shit. They absolutely can drain the lake if they want to. But maybe they know better than to try. My brother and I were spending the night in our grandparents' camp trailer, which sat about 20 yards away from our parents' house. We were staying there because our other set of grandparents were borrowing our bedrooms in the house for the evening as guests. Initially, my dad escorted the two of us out to the trailer and tucked us in. He locked the door as he left. That was at about 10 p.m., maybe 11 p.m. As my dad left, I turned on the light so that I could look at a book that I checked out at school that day. I laid there in bed and looked through the book. My brother was laying directly to the left of me in his sleeping bag. I was reading the book for about an hour when I noticed peculiar footsteps outside of the trailer. The footsteps were deep sounding thuds like deer make in the woods. I used to hunt, so I was familiar with deer sounds. There were always a lot of deer around our house in the night, so I paid it no mind at first. I was just thinking deer were walking around the trailer and on the lawn which surrounded the house. I continued to look through my book for maybe 15 minutes when I realized that the footsteps were not going away and were very close. This started to really creep me out. I reached up to the light and turned it off. At this point, I just listened. The footsteps continued in the vicinity of the trailer. This continued for about 10 minutes after I shut the light out. After this, the horrific started. At this point, my story is probably going to sound like an unbelievable haunted house story, but you must believe me. After this incident happened, I never spoke of it to anyone outside of the family for years. Recently, I've told my good friends and my wife this story because nowadays I guess I just don't care if they believe it or not, I was laying there listening to the footsteps when suddenly I heard what sounded like fingernails or claws gently brushing the side of the trailer and the trailer door. I was petrified. This continued off and on for a half of an hour. The next event was really creepy, the animal outside started to claw at or play with the ceiling vent in the middle and at the top of the trailer. I didn't see anything at first, but then I saw what looked like the silhouette of a long shaggy finger poking through the vent above the metal mesh screen. It reached from one end of the vent to almost the other side. This lasted for only a few seconds, and then the ceiling vent was still and silent. However, the footsteps continued around the trailer for at least an hour more. I figure it was past midnight by this time. During this period, I heard the animal trip over the trailer hitch or something like that. This was confirmed by the ping of reverberating metal. The animal continued to stay within the vicinity of the trailer after midnight. What happened next makes me believe that this animal was probably a Bigfoot. At this point, I heard a car turn off the main paved road and up our subdivision's dirt road, about a quarter mile away. As the vehicle closed on our location, the creature sprinted directly towards what sounded like an eastern direction. What I heard was deep, coherent, bipedal footsteps. This creature was very heavy, but bipedal. As it turned out, the car coming up the road turned into our neighbor's driveway. It was indeed our neighbors, and they appeared to have just come from a party by the way they were talking. They were only mere feet from my brother and I, but we were so scared that we couldn't move or yell for help. Our neighbors went into their house, and I continued to listen for the animal. I could hear the thing walking probably a hundred yards away out in the forest and sagebrush, but it appeared to be keeping its distance. I could hear the distinct bipedal footsteps. The creature did this for a couple of hours, and I was starting to feel as if it were getting safer. I went to sleep finally. However, some time later I was awakened by the sound of something literally punching or hitting the trailer. I heard the footsteps again up close. The animal was back. It walked around the trailer as it did earlier and then it appeared to go away and I went back to sleep. During the entire event, 
my brother and I did not move a muscle or even say a word to each other. The next day, we stayed in that trailer until my dad finally came looking for us at 11 am. We were two frightened boys. This sighting occurred in the west reserve of the Blue Mountain Range of the Umatilla National Forest en route to Tri-City. The forest in the region boasts excellent yellow pine and tamarack, covering approximately 800,000 acres. Yellow pine is more abundant and found in more suitable situations on this reserve than in any other part of Oregon. Trees grow to an impressive 30 to 50 inches in diameter, with a height of 150 feet not uncommon. To pinpoint the location accurately, I will have to consult a map. Upon checking, the sighting occurred just south of Hardman, Oregon, in the Umatilla National Forest on Highway 207. The city of Hardman is directly south of Hermiston, Oregon. My background is as a retired police officer. It is essential to understand that at the time, I did not want to be labeled as eccentric, if you catch my drift. This is why I refrained from telling anyone about this until now. The time of day was 11.30 p.m. in late October or early November 1980, the year Mount. Saint. Helens erupted in my home state of Washington. I can recall every detail. My truck was ascending the hill as best it could, with a top speed of 25 to 30 miles per hour. The Bigfoot was a medium brown in color, and I could see all of him as I was so close. His eyes had more of a glowing red color, and he had shaggy long hair. He was standing on the right side of my truck, approximately where you might see a warning sign for a curve or hill. This is what he was doing when I was at a distance. I didn't pay much attention until I was about 50 feet from him, at which point he was on the yellow fog line, still on my right. I have no idea what he was planning to do, like crossing the road or something else, until I got close enough to see what he was. Then it was too late, and I couldn't get that truck to go any faster. I was petrified. I will also add that this was not a well-traveled road at that time of night, I was just trying to get to the Tri-City area for the night. As I passed the creature, I noticed his head movement was like mine, he was looking at me just as much as I was looking at him. There was no movement like hostility or jumping, we were just looking at each other. His eyes seemed to be a reddish color. I do not know if that was because of the lights or not. He was about 8 feet tall, maybe less, maybe more. At that point, I did not care. I can describe his features. His hair was long but not shaggy, hanging perhaps 3 to 4 inches in length in various places. I am sure it was a male, as I saw no breasts, but at the same time, I did not see a penis either. I thought this could be under all the hair covering his body. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. This is the first time I have ever spoken about it, except to my wife. I forgot to mention that I live in Moses Lake, Washington. If you need any more information, let me know. Hope this helps, as I said before, I still get goosebumps. I went on a road trip by myself and was setting up my tent in a state park in New Mexico. I am a female and was in my mid-twenties at the time. A van pulled up and I could see through clothes hanging. There was a man that just sat there in the van for about 5 minutes. It was obvious he was living in this van. I had a hatchet in my hoodie's front pouch pocket. This guy gets out and starts walking towards me. I put my hand up and say stand back as I raise the hatchet in my other hand. He turned around and got back in the van and proceeded to watch me. I decided to pack my shit up and leave that little hatchet saved my life that day I am sure of it. I'm from Delaware. I guess I should start by saying I never truly believed in anything like Bigfoot Sasquatch or Swamp Apes. Before my encounter, I watched a couple of those silly Finding Bigfoot shows as a general interest when they first came out. But to me, it was just a show about some idiots walking in the woods at night. I watched a couple of episodes and laughed at them and moved on. 
I always considered myself an open-minded person to all things probable but Bigfoot, at the time, was way out of my scope of consideration, outside of the famous Patterson film and the Sierra Sounds. I never heard anything more on the topic unless someone was making a joke or some new TV series or movie about the topic came on. As for what I saw it was nothing spectacular. Not like what I had heard, but it was enough to make me a true believer. My encounter happened on November 20th, 2017, on the outskirts of Bear, Delaware. A close friend of mine and I had just moved there from Long Island, New York. Our home was a duplex that was at the end of a dead-end street. At the very end of the street was an old rusted and ivy-covered chain-link fence that was so overgrown and bent over. Beyond the fence, it was all woodland and the look of the area had enchanted me to check it out. My friend and I are photographers for various renaissance fairs and we would find wooded areas to take photos of people in their garb. I asked our new neighbors about the woods and they said we should not go back there. They told us people have gone in those woods and have come out with injuries from a variety of animals and a couple of boys had drowned in the swamp back there many years before. In her words describing the swamp, you'll never see it until you're in it. Despite this warning, I really wanted to check it out for myself. On the day in question, my friend left that morning to visit her mother and I stayed at the duplex. The weather was cold and windy, and it was a cloudy day with the feeling that we might be getting snow. I was so bored that I decided it was time to investigate the woods. I did not take my camera with me because I didn't plan to take any pictures and wanted to see if the terrain was not a trip hazard before I lugged in an expensive camera. I wanted to just make it back there to get an idea of the area and it was literally right next door to the duplex. I stepped over the fence and walked into the woods some 50 feet. After that point, the more I walked in I started to get this ominous feeling building up about me, but I tried to shake it off. The ground was all covered with what looked like many years of fallen leaves and sticks so it was like stepping on a 10-inch shag carpet. The trees were shedding whatever leaves still dared to cling on. I couldn't walk in this deep leafy area without making noise. I found a small open area and stopped to consider if it was a good spot to take pictures. Looking around that area for about 15 minutes I saw nothing much of interest to use for a photo shoot and that ominous feeling was still hanging around me. It never dawned on me till days later that I never heard anything in those woods the whole time I was in there. No birds, frogs, toads, or any other wildlife. Granted, it was close to winter, but still, even in New York birds were whistling about in the snow. I decided the area was dull and nothing to speak of, so I planned to find some other wooded place to take pictures. I began to head back to the fence when I began to hear a second pair of footsteps walking somewhere far behind me. I stopped, turned, and looked about. I saw no one nor any animal so I figured my ears were playing tricks on me. I went to turn to leave but before I could take a step I heard the footsteps again. It sounded like someone slowly walking, not running. I turned about again and this time I saw something step from beyond the trees from my right about 30 feet away from me. It was reddish in color, close to the same color as the leaves on the ground but its face was pinkish gray. I slowly squatted down where I stood and watched as this hairy covered thing just meandered through the woods. It stood erect and walked like a person, not hunched over and cumbersome like an orangutan or gorilla. Its legs were directly in line with its body, whereas a gorilla or orangutan walked more bow-legged. Its hair was long and I do mean hair, it was not fur. When the wind blew the hair waved about and I could see its pinkish gray skin underneath in a few places. That's when I became concerned and aware that this was no person in a suit. My first thought was someone was trying to prank me or make a film. I looked about to see a cameraman or someone but it was just me and this thing. I also remember thinking Bigfoot from the shows on TV, but this thing was not 10 to 12 feet tall like I heard people say they encountered. It was probably not much taller than me and I'm 6 feet tall it was thin, more like a person. I could not say if it was strong with muscles because the wind was blowing its long hair and blocking me from seeing any musculature as well as parts of its face. Then about halfway through this incident, 
I started to pick up a bad smell. It was like rancid meat that had been sitting out for a week. I think had it not been for the wind I would have smelled it sooner. What stood out the most to me was its ears which as best as I can describe were like pig ears. They were pinkish and stuck outwards but they were oval like a human ear. The hands were massive compared to its body. It was walking like a person just slightly bent over as if it were watching its way. I could not make out much of its face because of the wind but I know at one point I saw the whites of its eyes just for a second. The only parts of its body that were not covered in hair were its face, chest, parts of its belly, hands, and the inner parts of its wrists and inner arms. But as I said it was coated in hair, not fur. So it was not well covered, not like a dog, cat, or other animal. You would think such a critter would be freezing to death. The hair looked like it served very little protection from the elements. I continued to watch it. Three or four times it bent down like I was, squat or perched as some people called it. I watched as it moved the leaves with its right hand and stuck its hand into the dirt. It looked like it was looking for something. Whatever it was searching for it knew where to look. Then it got up, walked more, and repeated its actions. The third time it bent down and did this search thing it found something in the ground, pulled it out, and put it to its mouth. I could not see it clearly. Then as its back was somewhat toward me it stood and walked on. I did not move a muscle at all. My back and legs were starting to ache something bad. I watched this thing for a good 5 to 6 minutes and I was starting to regret not taking my camera. It just walked on till I couldn't see it anymore. I waited a bit longer. I wanted to make sure whatever it was would not hear me leaving. The one thing I still ponder about is that even though I was squatted down while watching it, it never noticed me. If it did it certainly didn't care if I was there or not. I mean I was squatted down but not behind anything. Its head stayed hung low like it was looking for something as it walked or like it was just watching its step. But it never looked further than that. I never told my friend what I saw, at least not at first. I just said it was not interesting at all for picture taking the sighting spooked me for a couple of nights because in my head I kept thinking that nothing was stopping it from stepping over that broken fence and into our open yard. Since my bedroom faced the woods I started to spook myself with the idea of waking up at night and seeing it in my window. My only comfort zone was that our neighbors had a German shepherd that could deal with it if need be. That's what I thought at the time. Now knowing the reputation dogs and Sasquatch have I'm not too sure that German Shepherd would have done much good. Eventually, my interest grew on the topic of cryptids and eventually, I told my friends and neighbors what I had seen back there. The neighbors were miffed that I went back there and said we told you not to. Then the guy broke down and told me one day when he first moved into the duplex years before, he took the dog back there and saw the same thing. The dog went wild and barked at it. He went on and said the hairy thing faced them, got angry, grabbed a small fallen branch, and threw it at him and the dog. But more like a warning. I drew an image of what I had encountered rather quickly and asked if what he saw in the woods looked like what I drew. That's exactly what he saw he said and his voice started to get shaky. I found this odd for a man who was a master trainer and owner of the martial arts dojo in the area. From there I just started researching the topic and started to find myself drawing and painting what I saw. Admittedly, I did go back in the woods about six maybe seven times with the camera in hand, but never saw it again. After almost four years my friend and I parted ways and I moved back to New York in 2020. At first, the whole experience spooked me. But now, looking back at the whole event, I'm glad it did happen. What I saw opened my eyes and mind more at the very least it has given me a new interest. I'm not sure if I want to see one again or not, maybe from a distance where I'm safe. I don't know really what to call what I saw. I have puttered about the internet and books looking for anything in the animal kingdom that looked like what I saw and I keep coming up empty. The closest images I came up with are various depictions of early Preyman. I have tried a few times to draw what I think the face would have looked like but with so much weather distortion and the angle I saw it I just cannot come up with something where I can say yes to. 
I feel it would be wrong to present to anyone a presumptive face. I did an overnight stay on top of a tall ledge, four miles up in the woods with my girlfriend, deep in the woods of New Hampshire. The hike was steep, difficult, and almost a bushwhack ascent. I totally expected there to be other campers up there when we reached the top to set up camp, but there was no one. It was a beautiful, peaceful evening with a spectacular sunset and stars to follow. However, as it got dark, I was left with a super uneasy feeling and spent the night tossing and turning, waking up to the smallest sounds. Needless to say, we were both up and eager early the next morning to hike back down. It wasn't anyone I saw that night, but during the descent, we passed a couple of friendly women doing a long hike through the area we were coming from and exchanged hellos and a quick conversation. About halfway down the mountain, I saw a tall, lanky, pale white dude with a big backpack walking up the trail. I watched his eyes stare down my girlfriend with the most predatory look I've ever seen a person give someone else. He hardly even noticed me until he was about 15 feet away because he was looking at her so intensely. When he saw me, I stared him down but said hello, giving him the benefit of the doubt. He looked at me with intense anger, as if he wanted to harm me just because I was there. I spent the rest of the hike down with a knife in hand, looking over my shoulder. I'll never forget how grateful I felt that we missed him by a day. It's unnerving to think that he could have been up there while we were there the day before, with a solid three-hour hike down and no one around. On or about mid-November 2012 I had a very unusual experience that at first kept me very mixed up but it always stayed in my mind until I started doing research. It was about 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. I woke to go outside and have a smoke. The area of the town of Bath, New York is semi-rugged with hundreds of huge foothills. There's a vast amount of forests, lakes, ponds, wildlife, and several state parks. Much of the land is posted, no hunting. The hills are super steep, so climbing or hiking is difficult. We rented the full basement apartment of a home. Our entryway was at the back of the home semi-underground. There was a deck over our entryway. I'm an ex-US Army Intel Special Tasking Veteran who served in Central America and the Middle East. I'm telling you this because I'm a trained observer and weigh out everything I see. I am super aware of my surroundings. That morning I went outside and lit up a cigarette. It was dark that night and cool. Deer would constantly wander through and many times I would try not to spook them. As I lit up my smoke, some movement caught my attention about 140 yards directly in front of me. To the east, a cinnamon brownish colored figure was pacing back and forth over and over. On each side of this clear cut, there are a couple of homes. This thing was at the far end of the next tree line pacing back and forth, moving towards the last home and back again, moving approximately north to south then back the other way. It was moving erratically, pacing back and forth like it was confused or undecided if it wanted to go closer to the home. As I looked at first I thought it was a drunk person. But in all the years I lived there I've never seen anyone out there. As I watched what really caught my attention was it looked like it was floating across the ground as there was absolutely no head bob at all. The ground rose between myself and this entity and went back down on its side, so I could not see the lower legs well. It kept on pacing back and forth for about three minutes at the position. I was under the deck in the shadows. I was not observed by this creature. I'm not afraid of too much but for some reason. The hair stood off up on the back of my neck and I got into what I call combat mode. I wanted to bellow out at this entity but something said not to do that. After around 3 to 4 minutes of this pacing, I turned my head for a second and it was gone. I got a fearful sense of where this thing went and had a feeling it may try to flank me around the two homes, so I went into the house, woke up my wife, and said, there's something weird out there. I didn't think Bigfoot right away because it's not the Patty type I have seen in the Patterson or Gimlin film. I always thought that they were in the Northwest, 
not here in New York State. It was, I believe, six to seven feet tall, had a slimmer build, wide on top, and slimmer than Patty, more like a fine-tuned athlete than a bodybuilder with long arms and an awfully long shaggy head of hair that stood out to me weird. The only reason I saw it was because there was a light on in that home that lit it up in some of the area. Upon seeing it, after the fact, I realized there was a hedge running parallel to it, and a large ravine behind that ran into the woods. Across from this property was a road with a couple of mobile homes, then a very steep wooded foothill, and a small mountain. For years this baffled me and I could not get it out of my mind until I found six reports entirely around my area in November of 2019. I heard two huge body shaking screams from the ridgeline very close to my new home in Bath, close to the same area. It was very loud, and not any animal I know of here. I know now what I saw and I know what I heard. I'm not quite sure what to write. I was hunting with some friends of mine outside of Addison, New York in November of 1986. I was a top man on a drive and I crested a hill and decided to take a break. Things were pretty slow as far as hunting, typical fall day, no overcast, dry conditions. I had just finished eating one of my many baby Ruths when something caught my attention about 50 yards east of where I was sitting down. I looked toward the direction and noticed something that was black running very fast down the side of the hill. It happened so fast that I wasn't sure what I was seeing. It appeared to be upright and about my height. I stand about 5 foot 9 inches and it ran with incredible speed. What is odd about this incident is that I had time to eat and sit down on a tree and at the time I was not even in stealth mode. I always scan the area before I stop for breaks just in case I may have missed any game. I almost felt as if whatever it was it was observing me and had enough. It was definitely in a hurry to leave. I observed it for only, at best, 5 seconds. I could hear it break deadfall once I lost sight as it ran away. There are bears in the area. I hunt, but this seemed to be taller than the average black bear. My first thought was that it had to be a bear, even though it was upright. I remember standing up startled once I had made eye contact with the running object it appeared to be at eye level. My second thought was maybe it was a black Angus steer that may have gotten loose from a farm. But, again, steers don't run upright. I was a little spooked by the incident, the same feeling you have when you stumble upon a grouse at close range. I thought again and surmised if it was a bear it was a very large one that was able to run on its back legs. I was not far from the end of the deer drive and met up with my friends at the truck. I asked them if they had seen a bear or any deer. They all said no. I did not tell them of the incident. On August 5, 1995, the Corning Leader newspaper wrote an article on a possible Bigfoot sighting near Rathbone, New York. This area is not far from where I was hunting. There were casts taken as well as hair samples by the Department of Environmental Conservation. To my knowledge, they were submitted to Cornell University for testing. I'm an avid outdoorsman and know most of the wildlife Texas has to offer. I live in central Texas about 10 miles outside of Austin near the town of Manor. I live in a fairly large apartment complex. Outside of my back porch is a highline easement about 40 yards out and running through it there are wild turkeys, deer, rabbits, skunks, possums, and other animals as well as a substantial size family of wild hogs in those woods. One evening at early dusk and still plenty of light left I was grilling some burgers and staring out at the other side of the highline at the tree line. There's a row of sugar cane along the outer edge of the trees that I have ranged at 106 yards. I jokingly said aloud, come on, Sasquatch. I know you're out there. So just show yourself. At that exact moment, a huge object walked out from behind the cane into the open. It was about 4 feet high, 7 to 8 feet long and it walked out about 10 yards and stopped. It surprised me so much that I said loudly, oh, wow. That's when it turned around and walked back towards the cane. 
I got a good look at it. It looked like a huge boar hog, I guess around maybe 400 to 500 pounds. It was massive compared to the hogs I'd seen out there before. As it walked behind the edge of the cane line I swear it stood up on its hind legs and walked behind the cane out of sight. It looked exactly like a Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or whatever they're called. It was just like all the photos and drawings we see. As it disappeared into the woods I was dumbfounded, to say the least, and I still question my sanity about what I saw. But what I understand after thinking about this maybe it was some sort of shape shifting or something. I don't know but I do know I saw what looked like a huge wild hog stand up and walk off on its hind legs. I have never heard or seen that happen before. I have seen hogs stand up on their hind legs momentarily but never walk as this thing did. On a big camping trip in western Appalachia around 2007, a group of maybe 5 or so of us kids, all around 7 to 10 years old, decided to go play around the waterfall, little river, and woods at our campsite. Such activities were not abnormal for us back then, and our parents weren't concerned if we were out of sight playing around the camp. Well, we wandered way far into the thick of the woods and got ourselves 100% lost. We couldn't even find the river again to follow it back to the campsite. We started following old campfires further back into the woods, but there were no discernible campsites nearby. As the day wore on, we were getting more and more freaked out, realizing how lost we were without food, water, or shelter. Eventually, we all gathered in a circle, trying to decide what to do when an old man approached us out of nowhere. He literally appeared out of the woods and walked up to us. I don't recall what specifically was said, but I do remember how wary we were and how we all got a weird feeling immediately. However, he ultimately shepherded us back and got us to a familiar stretch of the river so we could get to our camp. He didn't have a gun and wasn't in camo. He was dressed in flannel and overalls, so I don't believe he was a hunter. He didn't even have a backpack or anything, just an old man up in Appalachia who happened upon a gaggle of lost children in the middle of the woods and guided them to safety. It all turned out well, yes, we all got in trouble when the tipsy parents realized how long we had been gone, that we got lost, and then found by a mysterious mountain man. To this day, the memory gives me the heebie-jeebies. I was in California, I think around Humboldt, but I'm not sure. We were driving from Portland to San Diego on the ocean route. We pulled over after a bridge to go to the bathroom. There was a path down a canyon to a large stream. Immediately, I started seeing cheap stuffed animals about every few feet. These were the kind that feel stuffed with straw and crunch, the ones you win in a claw machine or at a carnival, with garish colors and texturally grotesque features. Halfway down, I felt I was far enough away from the road. I went back a little bit from the trail, pulled my pants down, and then heard, hi. I turned around and saw a toothless Jesus in his crucifix era sitting in a tent. The tent was made of these cheap stuffed animals, and Jesus was wearing a wind suit, 1990s soprano style. I looked up, and there were a hundred stuffed animals nailed to the surrounding trees or hanging on nooses made with shoelaces. I pulled up my pants, smiled, and said hi back loudly, overcompensating my discomfort with volume. My boyfriend on the path came running. He saw the man, waved to him, grabbed me, and ushered me away. We ran back to the car. If he wasn't there to corroborate what I saw, I would swear it was a hallucination, a Willy Wonka tunnel fever dream. My wife and I were camping in Crestone, Colorado. Middle of nowhere, we were drinking and having fun when we saw a truck with two dudes driving down blasting music. We raised our beers and cheered. The turned around, came back and parked in our camping spot parking. We were like oh shit. They asked if they could hang and because it was a full campsite we said okay. They were cool. Occasionally snotty? 
literally, and later told us they had snorted a bunch of ketamine. They ended up telling us most people in town did some kind of drug. It was all fun until they told us to hop in the back of their truck because they knew a great spot to watch the stars. My wife said let's go. And I said hell no. This is how people get murdered. To say the least after they left I got zero sleep that night. I lived in super rural South Arkansas and wandered the woods often as a child. I once ran into a neighbor kid, he lived about 12 miles away as the crow flies, filling in a very large, deep hole near my friend's house. She was there, staring him down and talking like she was in a trance. I froze, somehow she got away. We were both like 5 and he was 10-ish. He is rumored to have killed his brother and sister. He's gone now, died in a shootout with police after killing his wife who was our current governor's cousin. I think he was wanting for questioning about stuff he did while he was a truck driver too. When I was a teenager, male 18, I went away to attend an art school in Florida and I was walking along a wooded path next to a nude beach in Sarasota when I saw a torn page from a hustler type nudie mag. No, I was not naked then a little while longer another torn page on the path. Of course I picked them up to look. Then further down there was an unopened bottle of beer. When I bent over to pick it up I felt someone grabbed my butt. I yelled out, hey, and turned around and saw the face of this middle-aged man and it seriously looked like the face of a demon. He had the most twisted, crazed look on his face. He quickly darted into the bushes and I ran back to my dorm room. I later realized I had walked right into his trap. Luckily I am 6 feet 2 and could have overpowered him. But it has creeped me out to this day. Not technically backwoods but ran into something very creepy while tripping on mushrooms a few years ago. Was walking through a golf course and green belt in my neighborhood on a decent dose of mushies with a buddy. We were walking through the green belt and woods on a paved path, and as we approached a creek crossing we saw something that stopped us in our tracks. We had our phone flashlights on and were just bullshitting about when we saw the outline of a person sitting on the path. This was at 2 am or so. We just went silent and slowly approached and could then see a guy look up at us blinded by the lights. He was hugging or shielding a girl in his lap, facing each other. They were about our age and seemed normal. Think I just said excuse us and we swiftly walked past. After we got some distance it was just a laugh and WTF moment. Later I figured they were possibly tripping on something and the girl was having a bad trip. Then when we approached them they thought we were the cops perhaps. I don't know though, it was very odd to encounter them sitting there in the pathway in the middle of the woods in pitch black. I lived on a property called Upper Melinda for many years and it's a local story going back to which burning days, and long story short, they cut this woman in half, who was presumed to be a witch, and they buried each half in a different place and kept Lower Melinda a secret, to this day, no one knows where it is. The legend is, if her halves find their way back to each other, she'd come back to life and haunt the town. Or some such. Upper Melinda's gravestone is on the property I lived on and we had ghost hunters frequently hop our property looking for it. Anyway, I have a few encounters, one where my son almost went zombie-like, heading straight into the woods like he was possessed but the scarier memory was when I came home from work later one evening and my toddler son, at the time, would usually run out to greet me. It was dark that night and I heard him coming up to the side of my car, singing some tuneless something or other and I smiled, rolled down my window to tell him to watch out, I was parking and to be safe, etc. I could hear him right upside my car door and his sing-songing, and I didn't want to hit him with my car door. He went quiet, I opened my door and because it was dark and no light illumination, I started looking around calling him by his name and at that moment, 
The back porch light flicks on and my son comes barreling out the back door, followed by my husband. I was beyond confused because I'd literally been smiling and talking to a voice that sounded inches away from my car. The realization that it wasn't my son immediately sent icicles down my spine. It was 2017. I remember the date because at first, I thought it was an April Fool's. I was on the second floor of my house in Newbury, Berkshire, UK, and was getting ready to go to bed. I had just moved towards my curtains which had been open until this point. I saw an odd light outside. I originally thought it had been a reflection because I had my bedroom light on, but I turned the light off and it was still there. My room looked out onto a building site of a nursing home. The light was slightly covered by the corner of the building site which is when the light came round the corner. At first, I thought it was a pixie or mythical character because I didn't recognize it. It looked rather small from the tall window I was looking through. The thing was looking around as if it had lost something, and I thought I was dreaming so I knocked on the window, ever so quietly, yet it looked up at me. We stood looking at each other for many moments, with these huge eyes. I then stepped back from the window, to see if I walked back if it was still there. I must have stepped back from the window for about a minute, to refresh my mindset when I looked back outside, it wasn't there anymore. So relieved I shut my curtains and turned back to my room and it was on my bed. My bed was positioned in the middle of the room and my door was shut. I didn't see how it had got into my room but it was standing on my bed. It didn't meet my hips in height but had a very large head and skinny body. It was whilst I was staring at it, that it pointed at me and then back to himself or herself. That was when it came over to me but it was walking weirdly as if it had injured itself. I was sitting down at this point as I was feeling faint, I don't know whether it was the being's doing or the fact I was seeing something that shouldn't have been real. It touched me over my heart. It was so cold I couldn't physically feel the being but I could feel the energy, the coldness, and then it walked up the wall and through the open window, which had been closed before. I ran to the window to see two beings walking in the opposite direction than I had before, walking through the short hedge and disappearing just before crossing the road. Completely disappear into thin air. My twin boys were about seven when we got them a Dalmatian puppy for Christmas. One day while walking their puppy the boys disappeared for several hours. I searched the neighborhood, but couldn't find them. Just as we were beginning to panic, they returned home. We scolded them for being late, but they insisted they'd only walk to the corner when a large triangular shaped aircraft had appeared above them, and they decided to return home. They thought they'd been gone 10 minutes. I had them draw what they'd seen. They both drew an arrowhead-shaped craft which they described as the size of a football field. The craft had hovered above them for a moment when the neck began to glow and the craft accelerated, disappearing beyond the horizon. We didn't know what to think. Our boys weren't prone to making up elaborate stories. Where had they been? Years later we had our first grandson. The first time he spent the night at our place, I had my first and only case of sleep paralysis. I awoke to the throbbing sound of what I thought was a helicopter just outside our bedroom window. Then a bright light showed through the window. From the hall, our dog entered the room and collapsed in the light. I tried to wake my wife but found myself unable to move or speak. I tried to keep my eyes open, but could not. Upon waking the next morning, I asked my wife if she'd heard the sound. She had not. I told her of my experience, and we both decided it must have been a dream. My wife got up to make breakfast and check on our grandson. A minute later she returned with the sheet from our bed which she'd found on the kitchen floor. Somehow the sheet had been stripped off the bed from under the covers which were still on our bed. Neither of us had awakened during what must have been a struggle. I keep my arms above the sheet, and my wife tucks the corners. We still have no idea what had occurred. My family was visiting my grandmother, 
his widow, who still lived in the same house that she and my grandfather had always lived in. I remember we left to drive home just after nightfall, and to get home we had to drive through a busy main street through the center of town. So we're driving along and stopping frequently as a result of the numerous traffic lights on the route. As our car was stopped at one, I heard my mother say to my father, Oh my goodness, he looks just like your father. In the window over there. She pointed to the window of a barbershop on the other side of the street. My father, my brother, and I craned our necks to look in the barbershop. Even though it was on the other side of the street, it wasn't more than 20 feet away, and the contrast of the dark night to the bright lights within gave us a very vivid look at everything inside. Inside, standing at the window looking out, was a man who was a dead ringer for my grandfather. He was the same height, had identical facial features, the same hair, and the same thick-rimmed glasses that he always wore. However, what jumped out the most was the jacket he was wearing. It didn't look like just any jacket, but the exact one that my grandfather loved to wear, a light tan suede like one with woolen, sheep-like trim along both sides of the zipper and along the collar. He was just standing at the large window, which basically took up the entire front wall, staring straight out into the street. Wow, it does, my father said, but if he was any more amazed than that I'm not sure because he never brought it up again, at least in my presence. After a couple of seconds, the light turned green and our car propelled forward, the man in the window still looking straight ahead. To make it more interesting, the next time I saw my grandmother I told her that we had seen someone in the window of the barbershop on that street who looked just like grandpa. Since she hadn't witnessed it she couldn't make a big deal about it, but she did say that was the barbershop he had always gone to for a haircut. Now I'm not sure who the man in the window was, but it's still something I think about to this day, over 30 years later. We rent a home that, for reasons no one will explain, is about half the rental rate in our area. We've been here for five years, and the owner has not raised the rent a dime. Strange things consistently happen in the house. Most of them are pretty benign and easily dismissed, things being moved around without explanation, odd noises, feeling like someone is moving around when rooms are empty. Our dog will suddenly start barking at something he seems to see. But lately, things have become more aggressive. Several times, my wife and I have physically felt something touch us, only to turn and find the room empty. I felt a strong tap on my sternum. My wife had something blow in her ear, so deliberate that she actually started crying out of fear. Today was the strangest, I went to open a door to a stairway down into the basement this morning, and the whole door fell onto me. It had been taken off the hinges, with the pin still in the hinge part on the frame. Aside from me, no one in our home is capable of doing this. Our two kids are young. The door was fine last night, I heard nothing during the night, and our dog sleeps next to that door. I have no explanation. What should we do? The time I fought a demon attached to me for three months, when I was 18, I started having dreams of a long-haired skeletal girl crawling up my stairs. Every single night without stopping, it would just be a dream of her inching up my stairs, and it was slow like one step a night. She had a sunken in face, deep-set black eyes, and rose up rows of dark brown teeth. It took me a week before I knew something was wrong like these couldn't just be a nightmare. My stairs were always cold. There was a rotten stench that would hit me at times, and I was constantly irritable. At the end of the first week, I suddenly realized the cold, the smells, the heaviness in the air was in a different spot nightly, the spot she'd stop on the damn stairs. Days I wouldn't sleep for more than an hour or two after realizing I never dreamt of her if I slept less than four hours, maybe she could only manifest in REM sleep or something. I was constantly trying to find out what the hell she was and what I could do. I smudged my house, I threw up crosses everywhere, 
I felt like a mad woman as I drew protection symbols in holy water along my walls up the stairs and covered the area above my door with the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which if you ever have paranormal problems is the scapular that is associated with all protection. No matter what I did, I couldn't rid her, though. I was able to keep her at bay in the middle of the stairs, but that was it. I finally slept one full night without dreaming of her so I thought I finally got rid of her but no the next night she returned middle of stairs hissing, pacing back and forth, that was first night I seen her stand and she had to be around 8 feet cause she was only a few inches shorter than the dip of the wall going over my stairs. I did more searching and realized she wasn't actually trapped in the house. She was attached to me and knowing that I realized I damn wasted a lot of time because to banish her I had to change me, she was attached to my attitude and hoarding so I started cleaning my room often, constantly moving things to different parts of my room, I kept up as much positive energy I could and night by night, she was finally moving back down my stairs until one night she just never returned. It's been 17 years and I still sometimes wonder if she'll return. If she did that will be a damn terror cause my room is now next to the stairs but I think she's gone for good. I still got a paranormal house though. Now I got the top hat man, two ghosts and what I think is a mimic but they 900% chill compared to that scary bitch. This sounds absolutely crazy and like I'm insane but here it goes. In 2015 I came home from work early to let my dogs out before going to an appointment I had scheduled. I entered my home through the garage to kitchen door. As I turned the corner to my living room I looked for the dogs who didn't greet me as normal I looked down my hall and see a 8 foot white rubber suit type creature or man? Bending all the way out of my laundry room and although it was faceless I could feel it staring at me like I startled it. It had no features just tall white not human at all. I got the feeling like I just walked in on a home intruder almost as if we were both confused as to why each other were there. I started screaming and it recoiled like a snake immediately and it was gone. I never saw it again but a few months ago my grandma who lives on the property in another house told me she was cleaning her upstairs hallway she looked down her basement stairs into her laundry room and saw the white rubber suit man again. She then went on to explain she calls him that because she has seen him a few times and he is always near her washer or dryer. I almost lost it because the thing I saw came out of my laundry room. I have no explanation for it. My family has owned this property since the 60s when the original home was built and then mine in 2008. Before that it was part of a farm. The farm next to the house was recently preserved because the county considered it an important part of Civil War history it was used by both the Confederate and Union as a campsite and was the home to some small skirmishes. We were house hunting, and we went to a house that could have been the one, though it was small. It was a very old house, as all the houses I've lived in and my first one was haunted but benign. To get to the parents bedroom, we had to walk through the daughter's room. She was about 5. I've always been very sensitive, and I was standing in this girl's bedroom and the most evil feeling washed over me. I could feel very angry eyes on me, and it penetrated my soul. I didn't make it to the parents room, I couldn't stay in the child's room for more than a minute. I've experienced that feeling of evil only one other time in an ancient cemetery in Ireland. When the owners returned, I asked them if their house was haunted. They were oblivious, so I just shared that I had concerns about the daughter's room. Meanwhile, the realtor went into the kitchen and had a mild stroke about me asking, I thought. On the drive away from the house, he asked me why I asked that. He then revealed that he'd grown up in what is famously considered one of the most haunted house in the state. We had lots to talk about on the way back to his office. <laughs>